Our uh, speaker today is Harold Swartz, MD, uh, Master of Science of Public Health, PhD. He is also Professor of Radiology, Medicine and Physiology, Community and Family Medicine, Chemistry and Engineering. And he's also the director of the Dartmouth EPR Center and the Dart Dose C CMCR. He has also been involved in the development of magnetic residence for preclinical and clinical applications. He has done research and teaching on the biological effects of ionizing radiation since 1962 at several institutions, including Walter Reed, uh, Medical College of Wisconsin, and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champlain, and also at Dartmouth. Uh, the EPR Center at Dartmouth is especially focused on developing and applying in vivo EPR for uh, physiological measurements. Uh, he has developed at Dartmouth the first clinical program in EPR, which has a special emphasis on using the technique to measure radiation dose after the fact for the purposes of triage. He is the PI of one of the CMCR Center, Dart Dose, C Dart Dose CMCR, focusing on physical biodosimetry. Uh, he is the author and co-author of approximately 450 papers and four books, and he has received several international awards, including the Zavoisky Prize, uh, which you'll have to tell me what it is. <laughs> Uh, also, if you would please refrain from using laptops out of courtesy to our speaker. Uh, the title of uh, the talk today is posted up there. Please welcome Harold. Ah, okay, I did it. Well, thank you very much. This is a, a, a great pleasure and honor to be able to uh, speak. To, I haven't spoken to a full house like this. They obviously, uh, nobody read anything in advance. <laughs> uh, just for background, uh, Zavoisky, Zavoisky uh, is a Russian who... Uh, it invented, invented EPR okay. and uh, in Kazan and uh, uh, the committee screwed up and uh, gave me the prize <laughs> which was very nice it was a wonderful experience well uh, so what I'd like to do yes what is EPR? okay so it's electron paramagnetic resonance it's like MRI only it's based on unpaired electrons instead of nuclei it's, um, uh, and uh, I, will, I will get into that, but quite a ways down the line, so thank you. I, I should have clarified that earlier. And uh, thank you for the generous introduction. Uh, I will try to uh, not speak too long so that there's a chance for some questions. Uh, I think this is a topic that generates a fair amount of uh, heat, if not light. Uh, and uh, I'd be glad to try to uh, put, a, put a little light into it, too. Well, that's my title, and that's me, and you've heard more than you want. Uh, actually, all things being equal, I'd rather be out birding. Uh, so uh, my uh, full-time, my aim at full-time occupation is to be out watching birds and taking pictures. But I have this hobby of teaching at Dartmouth and doing research. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about about my hobby, but uh, have my uh, I'll use these pictures to uh, sort of uh, sort out between themes. Uh, some of them have some meaning, and some of them don't have some meaning. Uh, uh, but there, are, uh, but I thought this particular one is I'm I'm really uh, because radiation is such a complex and misunderstood topic uh, that I'm really going to try to do a little bit of hand feeding or beak feeding uh, to, uh, try to try to give you some digestible components that you can take home. Uh, the, 
So, uh, outline of the presentation for those of you who wish to fall asleep and wondered what you would have heard had you stayed awake. Uh, here's the outline of the presentation. Uh, so, I'm going to try to uh, get you to understand a little bit about the medical implications of uh, exposure to high doses of radiation. So, we're talking about high doses, doses that are high enough to make you sick over a short period of time. We're not, I'll talk a little bit about long term effects. Uh, uh, <coughs> I want you to understand the information at the level that you can explain it to others. And as I was talking to the students at the seminar, I had a wonderful, wonderful time uh, at noon, a seminar with the uh, PhD students who were a very uh, bright and interested and uh, challenging group. Uh, it, was a, it was a great pleasure to talk with them. And as I was explaining to them is, although you know that you don't know very much about such things. The world is pretty ignorant, and the fact that many of you are in the engineering profession lends a certain gravitas to your pronouncements about things like ionizing radiation. That sounds like something an engineer ought to know. Uh, power plants, that sounds like something that an engineer ought to know. So that when you make casual remarks. You know they're not serious, but the people that are listening to you don't. And so maybe you ought to really have a bit of understanding for the statements that you make uh, uh, so that you can uh, shed light rather than noise uh, into the process. And it's a, it's a real dilemma uh, because people really do take it seriously. For those of you uh, who have uh, st uh, even as uh, if any of you are freshmen in engineering, when you go home at the first break and people ask you about things that are utterly meaningless to you and you give a uh, and you give an answer and they act like you really know what you're saying. So it's a responsibility uh, that uh, you've assumed whether you want to or not. Uh, I want to talk then uh, about the public health implications about how do you deal with exposures of large numbers? What kinds of things should one be thinking about? Uh, uh, I want to differentiate between medical needs, medical risk, and an, a nuclear device, an improvised nuclear weapon, and an incident in micro, at a nuclear power plant and have you understand that, uh, and as I said before, uh, to provide some guidance because people will believe you, and to explain the context and needs for dosimetry in a large scale event, uh, partly because that's what we do, that's what my group does. And uh, so I'll, uh, if there's time at the end, I'll tell you a little bit about our research uh, and activities in that regard. So uh, this is the large event that we're talking about. Is there a pointer here, there, anywhere? Never mind. Uh, here's a sort of pointer. So uh, this is uh, people, planners, uh, say, what if? So this is an improvised nuclear weapon deposited in the center of Washington, D.C., they're not very big devices. Uh, about the size of this table, maybe a little bit larger. Uh, it's implausible that somebody would make a nuclear weapon, but it's not at all implausible that somebody would steal one or buy one. So uh, it's sort of a wonder that we haven't had a radiation event. Uh, they're not so improbable. They're going to be detonated on the ground. They're not going to be detonated from an airplane. Uh, more likely, they'll be detonated in a port, in a, car in a container ship. And you look, have been to, court, to uh, ports, and you see these huge numbers of containers, uh, a small percentage of which are inspected superficially, and an even smaller number that are uh, profoundly inspected. And a nuclear weapon wouldn't be giving off very much radiation. It wouldn't be so hard to uh, disguise it. 
and a, a uh, port would be a really marvelous target. Oh, thank you very much. That's uh, would be a really marvelous target because you get a twofer. You know, there's less than 10 major ports in the United States. Uh, if you can knock out a port, uh, you not only would have the terror at that particular site, but you'd really have a, a real wrench into uh, the economy for a long time. Uh, so, uh, if you had an improvised nuclear event, uh, you then you'd have right here in the center, and I'll show you a little bit more about that, uh, but the main radiation effects would be the fallout. And this is the plume of the fallout. Uh, this is a cumulative total of people exposed. This is probably a, uh, uh, a best case rather than a worst case scenario. 300,000, uh, potentially 200,000 fatalities, and probably another 2 million people that are really worried and have to be measured. So uh, th that's an event that's really hard to think about. Uh, so, uh, in general, uh, physicians aren't, shouldn't really be focused uh, in radiation events on the, uh, on the dose because most radiation events are small, they're individual, uh, and you don't treat the dose, you treat the patients. But if you get into a large event, uh, then you've got this logistical system of maybe I've described two and a half million people uh, who think they're at risk, uh, have reasons to think that they're at risk. You have a healthcare system that's been severely compromised, completely overwhelmed. Uh, it takes about three burn patients to overwhelm a major hospital. Uh, I was in Arizona when uh, Representative Giffords was shot and there were about a half a dozen uh, people that were wounded. Uh, I, was, I was actually visiting my sister and was by a hospital where two of the uh, victims uh, were brought and uh, with all of the uh, stir and the police and so forth, there was utter chaos for several blocks around. Uh, so if you divide two into two million, uh, that means you've got a million such sites if you could divide them. It's, it's impossible. And so what you have to do in order to respond to the event is you need to sort through and find out those that need to go into the health care system in order to try to deal rationally with them. Uh, and you want to get those who won't benefit out of the system. Uh, and you've got the worried, well, uh, there have been a couple of experiments done. Uh, uh, inadvertently, uh, in Brazil, there was a, an exposure where somebody disposed of an old uh, uh, cobalt uh, therapy machine, uh, uh, and there was some bits and pieces of the cobalt that uh, somehow got dispersed and carried around. And there were about 15 people who ended up with significant exposures uh, in this uh, relatively unsophisticated, probably not as worried of a town as Hanover, uh, when they uh, asked anybody who thought that they may have been exposed if they wanted to get measured, they should come to the local soccer stadium. They had 60,000 people. Uh, and that was reasonable. It's reasonable for people to come. Why should people believe the government or the power plant operator uh, that says there's nothing, don't worry, uh, and pat you on the head. Uh, so uh, we're talking about, uh, I'm going to talk some about dosimetry, and so you're, uh, it, it's the, a system problem. Well, let me really skip this. And this is, this is how we're sort of organized to do it. It's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, the government gives me uh, a, a unreasonable amount of money right now to work on response, maybe nine million dollars to me and my colleagues. Uh, and I'm supposed to prepare for the event, but one of the things they won't disclose to me is what the event is. Uh, <laughs> so that the uh, uh, the planning scenarios are, are, are secret. 
uh, somehow that would help the terrorists. Uh, and uh, one might think that it might help the people that are trying to re to prepare for it, but never mind. Uh, so, uh, so how do you organize? So this is kind of a general organization, and maybe that's good enough. So you would have this area where there was uh, uh, essentially everything destroyed. So, there, so people within that area would have a lethal dose of radiation, but they wouldn't die from the radiation because they were already dead from the blast or from the thermal, and you only get to die once except in the movies. Uh, uh, but coming downwind, you'd have this large number of people that were getting exposed. And they would be gathered into uh, emergency treatment uh, centers. They wouldn't be in hospitals because the hospitals couldn't carry them, take care of them uh, uh, initially, uh, for, especially for screening. And besides, most of the hospitals would probably be here in the, uh, uh, in the affected zones. And in major urban centers, most of our hospitals are gathered together uh, uh, in, the, in the same area. So what are the medical issues? Uh, how does radiation, what does radiation do? How does it affect us? Uh, radiation has many effects, but in fact, if you want to understand the biological effects of radiation, why do people die or get sick or get side effects, they're amazingly simple. Uh, the total amount of energy in a lethal dose of radiation is equivalent to the turtle, total amount of thermal energy in this cup of tea. It's a very small amount of energy. It's distributed in big lumps so that it can change, so that every molecule that it encounters can be changed, but only a very few are changed. So how do you get lethality out of this much energy? And uh, so there must be something very special and important that gets damaged by radiation. And when you go through all of the possibilities, uh, eventually you realize that it's all in DNA. And it's all in damage to DNA. So if you understand that ionizing radiation does most of its damage by affecting DNA, then you understand almost everything about radiation effects. And uh, the DNA, it doesn't damage that much DNA, so it isn't that the DNA stops working. The critical time is when the cells try to divide and to make new cells and then the DNA must line up very precisely, and that's when cells die. So radiation doesn't kill cells. It prevents them from dying and then they, uh, from dividing, and then when they try to divide, they die. So if you try to figure out, well, what, how would that result in medical effects, then you'd say, well, what kind of cells do we need in order to live? And the ones that turn out to be most critical are the ones in the bone marrow, because they make our white cells for infection and our platelets for uh, keeping blood uh, uh, clotting. And uh, that's why people die of radiation. It's as if their bone marrow has been wiped out. Uh, so uh, that, those are, that's really the medical issue in ionizing radiation. Uh, the long-term effects are on DNA, things like mutations and cancer. Uh, so it's all pretty straightforward. It's, it's not very mysterious. Uh, the critical dose is too great. That doesn't mean very much. I can convert it to ergs per gram. That doesn't mean very much. I can convert it to joules. It's not a lot of energy. Anyway, uh, the, the, uh, we'll come back to the units of radiation in a comparative basis, uh, uh, which is useful, uh, talking about radiation in the environment and so forth. Uh, so uh, on the radiation level, that's a lot. Uh, uh, at higher doses, you get up, uh, then the gastrointestinal tract uh, becomes the problem. Uh, so uh, we want to measure the dose uh, in a large event, uh, like an improvised nuclear device or Fukushima. Uh, you'd have uh, two, uh, two, di two different stages. Uh, one is when you've got uh, hundreds, thousands, and millions of people, and you have the first stage where you're trying to just divide them into those that go into the healthcare system and those that don't go. Uh, and then, uh, in a, uh, and, and in order to do that, you want to make the measurements quickly, and you want to make them in the field. You can't take and send a sample somewhere, uh, and get it uh, processed, and bring it back. Uh, you couldn't do that uh, after Katrina 
you couldn't do that in Vermont after Hurricane Irene. Uh, when you have disasters, you don't have good communication. Uh, uh, there's a second time which didn't occur in Fukushima because there wasn't anybody hurt, uh, except for a couple of workers, where you would then want to get better doses so you knew how to manage the medical care. Uh, but that's not our main issue. Uh, so how do we measure the dose? Uh, you can use, uh, you could have everybody f wear a, a film badge, uh, but the probability of everybody keep having the film badge on at the time that you need it uh, is somewhere between very low and non-existent. Uh, even in radiation facilities, where people are very cognizant and highly trained. They keep having accidents uh, occasionally, uh, very low rate, but when they have the accidents, almost always somebody doesn't have their dosimeter on. There may be some relationship there. Uh, and so at least the authorities have given up with the idea of having people wear radiation monitors or even trying to put them into their, uh, uh, in, into the credit cards in their pockets or in their cell phones or whatever, uh, it, it, they've decided that isn't practical. So what do we do? Well, uh, from our point of view, uh, from the point of view of, of, of a number of people, so what we're doing is uh, we'll let you be the dosimeter. Well, uh, our particular approach is to use teeth. Uh, generally, you carry your teeth around with you. Uh, we're also using fingernails. Usually you have your fingernails attached so that you always have your radiation badge with you. And, uh, uh, and there's others that are using uh, cellular changes, uh, molecular biology. So that, that's biodosimetry. Uh, and that does something else that's very important is it takes the dose estimate from a general pronouncement of don't worry, honey, everything's okay, to individuals where you actually measure it. Uh, actually, in most events in Japan, if there was something in uh, Vermont uh, Yankee, uh, the authorities really would know, uh, especially for nuclear power plant disaster, would be able to monitor the radiation. They'd be able to tell you whether or not you were at risk. You wouldn't be at risk, uh, but you wouldn't believe them. And so you probably need, need to measure uh, anyway. Uh, and uh, why you don't you believe them? It's because you're logical and reasonable, and you've heard so many stories and had so many distortions uh, that it's probably unreasonable to believe the pronouncements rather than to uh, uh, want to have it, have it measured. Uh, the reason we're doing biodosimetry, and then we're going to move into the uh, uh, Fukushima uh, uh, more more closely, uh, if you look up on the web, they you can find how to deal with a uh, uh, improvised nuclear event or an event like Fukushima or an event like Vermont nuclear, and they tell you what you should do. Uh, you should assess the dose by determining the time to onset and severity of vomiting, measure the lymphocytes over several hours look for chromosomal aberrations in the blood from lymphocytes, which you culture for 72 hours, and clinical signs and symptoms. Uh, and it's interesting, if you think about those, uh, the vomiting, which in fact is something you could measure, you could tell whether or not somebody vomited, uh, uh, probably. Uh, if you look at the dose-response relationships, uh, we said two gray was the threshold uh, six gray you went into other, and it's plus or minus three gray, so it's perhaps not so wonderful. Uh, the lymphocyte count, uh, can you imagine doing uh, serial blood draws, having an expert uh, measure, measure and count the lymphocytes in the field uh, several times? Uh, uh, chromosomal aberrations, you just need to uh, take the cells and incubate them for uh, 48 to 72 hours and then have an expert uh, try to read the chromosomes uh, and the clinical signs and symptoms develop too slowly. So it's basically we really don't have any uh, guidance. Uh, uh, what about long-term effects? Uh, radiation uh, causes cancer. It's well established. 
Radiation causes mutations. It's well established. Radiation uh, causes fetal malformations. It's clearly established. All of, uh, but the key aspect is what's the dose response relationship? Uh, and it turns out that uh, people haven't really done the right experiments. They haven't taken 100,000 people and exposed them to a known dose of radiation and found out what happened to them. Uh, the uh, IRBs get in the way of these things. Uh, so one, what you have to do is you have to go from human experience and try to uh, come down. But when the human experience is all where you've seen these effects are all at doses that are thousands or tens of thousands of times higher than the doses that are involved. And uh, it, it's not so easy to extrapolate down to low numbers. So our, our data are, are, are very poor. Uh, uh, but in general, uh, as far as cancer is concerned, uh, the amount, the dose that requires to get a statistically significant increase in cancer is very high, takes a long time to develop. So that in general, so if you're thinking about personal x-rays, uh, 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 the risk on an individual is very low. And uh, if you get an x-ray, if you insist on an x-ray or a physician orders an x-ray for something that can't possibly help you, uh, then, uh, then the benefit, so the benefit's zero, the risk is something, and when you start having fractions that have zeros in them, those are bad fractions. And so, uh, so you need to have some potential benefit. But if you have some potential benefit, uh, then almost always it's the, the, the risk is negligible. Uh, it's a mutagen. Again, the risk is to the, here the risk is to the population. Again, dose-response relationships, and it's a relatively rare event. Uh, fetal malformations take a high effect. So radiation can cause these effects, but you need to think about the doses. Uh, and the general rule is uh, unnecessary radiation, radiation that does no good, is bad. Radiation that's used in a rational way for a purpose, generally uh, the uh, benefit outweighs the risk. Looks like we're going to change subjects. So Fukushima, finally we got close to the title. Uh, how does this differ from an improvised nuclear device that I've been talking about, this large event? The, uh, so there was uh, full awareness, I lost my F, uh, of the potential for exposure. So that means that there weren't any unexpected expo or unknown exposures. There may have been unexpected exposures. So the radiation from Fukushima or a radiation event from Vermont Yankee would be in the form of radioactive materials that would be released into the environment. These can be monitored uh, with very high sensitivity with very low-tech devices, a Geiger counter. You can count the radiation. So there should not be, and, and, uh, and within the community, uh, within the response agencies, uh, there should be no problem in determining what those rates are. And there weren't in Japan, and there were well-published levels of radiation. It was really, the confusion was on the interpretation of what those meant. And we want to talk about that. So uh, there aren't going to be any surprises in terms of radiation exposures, as there would be with a improvised nuclear device where you have no way of knowing what the radiation exposure is, because it's not, uh, it's from doses that are no longer involved with radioactive isotopes that are there. Uh, so the monitoring was extensive. Uh, the levels of exposure were and are likely to remain very low. Uh, a worst-case scenario for Vermont Yankee uh, should not approach Fukushima. Uh, and, and that's really true uh, uh, for many reasons. Uh, first of all, Fukushima was an extraordinary event. Here was three reactors, five pools of spent rods, all undergoing catastrophic events simultaneously. Uh, 
uh, that certainly was beyond anybody's reasonable expectation. But of course, there's a lesson there. Uh, so uh, one ought to be careful about reasonable expectations because sometimes they're not so accurate. Uh, but uh, but that's unlike. But uh, I think it's especially because we learned something, and hopefully, uh, the engineers, uh, that magic word, are. Uh, uh, are, are already working on and realizing what happened to Fukushima. Uh, what were the engineering problems? So you had, un first you had uncontrolled fission. So the way a nuclear reactor works is you put together some naturally radioactive material, uh, either uranium or plutonium, uh, that gives off neutrons. And the neutrons hit another molecule and they split the molecule apart, uh, make it uh, unstable because you've changed the neutron to proton ratio, uh, uh, and it gives off a lot of energy uh, and several neutrons. And so if you have your fuel configured such that more, on the average, more than one neutron is absorbed. It has to be only 1.01 neutrons absorbed per fission. Uh, then you've got a chain reaction, and it builds up very fast. And the way a nuclear <laughs> reactor works is you put something in there that it's essentially, you, you have the fuel arranged carefully. Uh, you put something in there that is essentially a neutron absorber, uh, and you move it up and down uh, so that you keep N equal 1.001, so you're getting the heat, but you're not going wild. What, uh, when they lost power and they lost cooling, they lost the ability to control. Uh, but that was a relatively short but disastrous period of time. Uh, uh, and then there was a, there's a tremendous amount of heat that nuclear reactors work by generating heat, boiling water, uh, uh, or generate, and so the heat keeps going on even after you stop the uncontrolled fusion. Uh, and uh, there are limitations on the physical structures. The fuel rods are intrinsically limited because they, they have tremendous stress. There are other things that could have been engineered, will be engineered better. Uh, uh, how long it'll take is a thing that one's got to worry about. Containment was uh, uh, in. Uh, in retrospect, the containment that was at Fukushima was a containment, you know, so everything else goes bad. You want to have a big house over it so things don't fly out. And uh, they used a containment that was known for many years to be inadequate. Uh, and they uh, proved it. Uh, and they lost cooling capacity. So <laughs> the biggest problem was that they put these nice... Uh, uh, the pumps and the emergency generators for, man for manning the pumps in the basement. <coughs> and, uh, of course, the tsunami came along and filled up the basement full of water and uh, knocked out external power, and, uh, and they'd lost cooling capacity. And, and that, uh, so that shouldn't happen. There aren't too many tsunamis on the... Uh, uh, on the Connecticut River, uh, and even our major flood didn't do too much to the Connecticut River. But presumably, hopefully, and I don't know that for sure, uh, they've now figured out that they've got to get backup power that is in a place uh, that won't that won't get lost. And so it's this inadequate planning which makes me optimistic that we are, that's something that ought to be solvable pretty quick. Uh, containment is 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 a longer term. So we exceeded, in Japan, the permissible levels of radiation. Uh, and that caused a lot of anxiety. And uh, so what's a permissible level of radiation? Well, a reasonable person might figure that a permissible level of radiation is the amount of radiation that if you stay below it, you're safe. And if you go above it, you're not safe. It's a perfectly logical, reasonable, completely incorrect <coughs> description. Uh, permissible level of radiation is the amount of radiation that you're allowed 
to let out. And how do you determine that? Uh, so uh, the analogy I like to use that's pretty easy to understand is say you're running a radioactive, a laboratory that uses radioactive iodine. And uh, it's not good, it's not terrible, but it's, uh, there's no benefit to letting the radioactive iodine outside your laboratory. Uh, on the other hand, something good is happening in your laboratory. Maybe you're using it for medical purposes. Maybe you're using it for experimental purposes. So you do want to be able to use it. And so what are the permissible levels uh, for letting it out? Uh, and the permissible levels then are set by that which is practical. That is, well, how can you keep, how can you still operate reasonably, carefully, and, uh, and if you do that, will there still be some that will get out? And that always happens. That substance always happens. Uh, the, uh, so that the, uh, the problem then, uh, so what you do is you set the permissible levels at, the, at what you can do. Uh, you can't set them at a level that's really a health hazard. If it's a health hazard, then you can't do it. So the permissible levels are, in fact, nothing to do with health risks. They have to do with practicality. And so the fact that in Japan they exceeded the permissible levels for things like iodine and cesium did not mean that there was a health hazard. That's a separate calculation, unrelated. And that's really important to know. And they keep lowering the permissible levels, not because there's increased knowledge about the health effects of radiation, but that there's increased competence, ability to keep it lower. And if it's not doing any good in the environment, you'd rather not have it there. Uh, and if it's not doing any good where you're producing it, then you ought not to be doing it at all. So it's always this, you know, it, life would be so easy if radiation was bad, if coal was good, if everything was black or white. Life would be so easy, uh, but it isn't. And... Uh, All right, so the, the major factor that, so what are the outcomes from Fukushima? So at this point, one can say confidently on the basis of well-established medical knowledge that there is no, medic, no significant medical risk any, at any reasonable distance from Fukushima. There, is, there are increases in some places in background radiation. There is no known risk associated with it. Radiation's been around for a long time, so there aren't some major risks that are going to occur. Uh, there are, in the vicinity, some local levels in the environment that are undesirable. Uh, they probably would not lead to uh, detectable health outcomes, uh, but they're probably, uh, the, the, some of the land will probably not allow people to be there. Uh, it, which is a reasonable precaution. Uh, within the complex, there were two real exposures well, well below the, the level that would cause the acute radiation syndrome, uh, and, and, and that took incredible incompetence for that to occur. Uh, it turns out in Japan there are two types of uh, uh, nuclear power plant workers. Uh, there are the uh, about 10% that are well-trained, well-equipped, uh, well-monitored, and there's about 90% who are uh, grunt workers, who uh, are uh, unskilled labor, lots of things that need to get done. Uh, they are modestly monitored when they get over their permissible dose. Uh, they're not allowed to work there anymore. Uh, and then they leave and they go work at another nuclear power plant and start over. And so most of the workers in the Fukushima plant did not have radiation monitors. Uh, the two, they spent two people 
uh, without radiation monitors to do what was actually, uh, they, I would think people would have realized was going to be a problem. They waded through water that was heavily contaminated with boots that did not extend as high as the water. Uh, uh, so most of us around here have done that in creeks and uh, <laughs> Uh, and we know what happens, and that happened. The boy. And so they did get uh, some uh, significant radiation dose, especially to their legs. Uh, but in fact, uh, th th that's probably, and, and there may have been a few workers that have some significant long-term risk. But the actual, so in this event, the number of people that got really significantly exposed is quite small. So uh, I'm going to run out of time soon because uh, I want to leave uh, about 10 minutes for discussion. So let me try to give you some numbers to give you perspectives for accidents and for medical procedures. And the most useful thing is to compare these exposures with exposures that are occurring all the time. Under, and, and I'll show you some interesting ones. Uh, and to consider what are the effects of these exposures. Uh, and what is the cost of the alternative? Not, not just the dollar cost. The dollar cost is important. But the uh, uh, costs in terms of efficiency and comfort, uh, 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 et cetera. So uh, here's a table uh, not too useful. So the, uh, we're going to use Millie Sievert. So you know, it doesn't care. We could call them Millie Rutabagas. Uh, it doesn't matter. But they give us an order of magnitude. So 10,000 of these is what you use if you want to suppress the whole bone marrow uh, for a bone marrow transplant. Uh, a lethal dose of radiation, which 50% of the people would die, is about 4,500 of these. And the threshold is probably around 2,000. The most heavily exposed people living in Chernobyl uh, received about 400. The annual dose for x-ray technicians is 3.2. The maximum permissible dose, uh, excluding natural background and medical exposure, uh, is 1.7. Uh, here's a good one. Here's natural background in Boston is 1.02. Natural background in Denver is 1.8. Why? There's more minerals in the ground in Denver, and it's higher, so it has more cosmic radiation. So if you're thinking about taking active steps, like evacuation, when something goes up 0.1, then you've got to explain to me why we're not moving everybody out of Denver into Boston. Uh, and so those kind of perspectives, the annual dose if you live in a brick house rather than a wood house, so it turns out the three pigs had it all screwed up, you get more radiation if you live in the, in the brick house, uh, is 0.07. Uh, uh, of course, it doesn't do you very much good if you're already eaten by a wolf. Uh, so there's some cost-benefit <laughs> ratio. <laughs> there are some places uh, in the world, uh, the, uh, I think the champion is uh, Ramsar, Iran, where the background radiation is 130. That's 100 times more than in Boston. People have looked. They've not found any detectable medical effects. There may be some, but it's uh, statistically a very difficult thing to do. Uh, here's a table from the literature. I, I'll show you blow-ups of the table. This is really neat. This is a, done by somebody who says he's an amateur. He wasn't really quite an amateur, but he pulled things out of, out of the uh, literature and, and made some wonderful, very useful comparisons. So uh, I don't know how well this reads, this projects, but this top one, so now we're in units. These are in micro sieverts. Uh, we're in millisieverts, it doesn't matter again. Micro rutabagas would be just as good. Uh, sleeping next to someone, you get 0.05. That is, if you sleep alone, you get less radiation than if you sleep with someone. Why is that? Because we have natural uh, radioactive potassium in us, and uh, so uh, they're 
your bed partner is breathing out probably other things that are much worse, but they're breathing out some potassium, uh, and so you're better off. Uh, if you eat a banana, you get 0.1, so that's, that's, that's the good news. Uh, you could sleep with two people or eat one banana. <laughs> Here's another good one. Living within 50 miles of a nuclear power plant for a year, you get 0.09. So that's the same as two nights with, a, with sleeping with somebody. Living within 50 miles of a coal power plant, you get 0.3. That is a factor of three more than a nuclear power plant. Coal plants put out more radioactivity than nuclear power plants. Why do they? Because coal contains uh, uh, radioactive elements which get released when you burn it. Uh, and certainly they contribute much more radiation to the environment than nuclear power plants. Uh, uh, these are, so these, these little squares then are relative doses. Uh, this one, I'm not sure it's correct, is using a uh, uh, a monitor for a year. Uh, I think that's pretty old and wrong. Uh, this is one day in Colorado. This is dental x-rays, background dose in one day for a person. So if you get somebody that tells you you've got a change like this and cancer has tripled, that's kind of a funny, unlikely outcome. So having some, this one down here, it's a big one. This is air, airplane flight from New York to LA is uh, for, 40. Uh, so that gives you an idea of the orders of magnitude. But you see, you can measure these things, and you can tell, and and that's part of the problem. Uh, here's a uh, uh, one. Just here's the extra dose in uh, Tokyo uh, uh, in the weeks following Fukushima, uh, 48 millisieverts. Uh, it's a little bit less, uh, about half of what you'd get living in a in a stone house for a year. So there is some detectable dose, but it's pretty damn small. It would be the same thing from, uh, except you wouldn't get as much radiation. Uh, this is from Three Mile Island. Uh, it's probably an overestimate. Uh, again, it was about the equivalent of living in a brick house. Uh, so uh, this is the maximum dose. So. Most of these things, most of these exposures, these exposures in Japan, were in the noise in terms of known effects, and there aren't going to be some unknown effects. Uh, these are the doses uh, at the extreme of Fukushima, still 40. Uh, that these two compare with a fatal dose, even with treatment. Uh, which is this size. So it's, it's kind of a neat, uh, uh, a neat table. And it, what it tells you then uh, is something about the exposures. I've talked about radio iodine, I think, and I won't. And I really, uh, I was going to tell you about our center and the wonderful thing that we're doing there, but I'm not uh, just to tell you that what we're trying to do in our center is to produce dosimeters that could be Sent. We talked about sending, uh, th they're designed for a nuclear z disaster, like an improvised nuclear device. Uh, we offered to send it to Japan, uh, even though on at least two grounds it was absolutely irrational to send it. So why was it irrational? First of all, it's designed for situations where you don't know whether somebody was exposed. In, in Japan, they knew who was exposed. Uh, secondly, it's designed to detect levels of radiation that are a hundred times or more higher than the levels of radiation uh, that were being experienced in Japan. Uh, why would we, why would they want it? Because there are lots of causes of degradation of human health and anxiety is a significant one and uh, panic is a significant one and the question was whether uh, it would be useful to have a measurement by a external device that was measuring at the individual area. Uh, it turned out not to be practical to do that, uh, uh, which was just as well. 
Uh, you know, because in a way it seems sort of silly. You know, we talked about, well, should we send it and not turn it on because there was no need to turn it on because there was nothing we could detect. But at any rate, we, we didn't. So that's what we're doing. We're trying to develop those materials. Uh, and I'm just going to zip right down to uh, through all of these wonderful things that we're doing uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and show you. So this is at the Prouty where we're making measurements in the teeth. Uh, and this is uh, putting it all together here. Uh, so in the, if there is a big event or a lar large exposure, it's really necessary to, to carry out triage. If you look at the guidelines right now, they're really bad. Uh, and there's, uh, it's a whole other lecture why such bad guidelines are there. And we think that biodosimetry will do that. Uh, uh, we think our stuff is good, uh, which most people who are doing something think what they're doing is good. Uh, take home lessons regarding health risks. Normal operations at nuclear power plant have really very low health risks. That's not to say that the people at Vermont Yankee haven't mismanaged and haven't lied and haven't and have done some really dumb things. But what they haven't done is to uh, endanger our health. Uh, the worst case scenarios for some place like Vermont Yankee are very unlikely to cause acute health problems. And they're probably likely to have very low long-term risks. Uh, so the reason to shut or keep up Vermont Yankee ought to be on something other than health effects. Uh, there probably were some effects from Fukushima in the United States, which was from people taking potassium iodide uh, from the side effects of potassium iodide, which couldn't possibly help them, but has, like all drugs, uh, has an effect. If you take enough water, you can make yourself sick, and if you really work on it, you can kill yourself. Uh, so everything has side effects. Uh, much as we would like to have uh, drugs that only, that only help uh, or have things that only hurt, at it's not what happens. Uh, so, some more take home. Be careful about what you say. The public doesn't know how dumb you are about these things. Uh, they're likely to believe what you say. Uh, having some evidence-based information is probably not a bad idea. Uh, in general, the risks are low, and most of the risks are inappropriate, will be from inappropriate medication and anxiety. Uh, detonation of a nuclear weapon is an unbelievably damaged event for which we're very poorly prepared. And uh, this work is the work of many, many people at, uh, at Dartmouth, at other places. Uh, I've outlined in red uh, three of the most important people at Dartmouth that have done the work, including Ann Flood, co-director co who's here uh, uh, of our centers, but we have collaborators around the world uh, that are involved. And this is our local group, and I thank you for your attention. And it, Before I open the floor to questions, I wanted to point out that the chart that uh, Hal's shown us uh, uh, can easily be found on the uh, net, uh, if you look up radiation dose chart, for those of you who are interested. Uh, questions now? Go ahead, Jay. How could Fukushima have been so close to plans for an earthquake and a tsunami? Those are pretty common in Japan. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and that's a that's a good so, you know because Japan is Japan's a very sophisticated country. Uh, it has uh, it's got a it's got about ten times more engineers than the United States. That may explain it, uh, but uh, but actually the uh, uh, the basic the fundamental problem was that their worst case scenario for a tsunami, not for the earthquake was off by a factor of three or four. Uh, so three or four turned out to be a really big factor because that was how high you built the walls. And the damn tsunami came over the wall and, and everything went from there. 
uh, in retrospect, you'd say even if you knew, even if you were right about the tsunami, you shouldn't have put your reserve power in the basement because you know basements always flood. I don't know anybody here who's had a basement. If you have a basement that's never flooded, wait, it will flood. <laughs> If you're way up on a hill, it'll flood from the top when the toilet overflows. But a basement will flood, and uh, you know, and the containment. So uh, Japan has a particular political problem. There is there has been a very strong connection, political economic connection between the power plant operators and the power plant regulators. And that's not very good. We have some similar things in the United States, maybe in our financial markets. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering, uh, given all these risks you've talked about, what your view is related to nuclear power versus coal versus oil, fire, and natural gas. And should we continue to expand and add more nuclear power plants uh, if I was running the world, which thank God I'm not, uh, the rational decision would be, I believe, that the lowest immediate polluting, putting aside the very difficult problem of long-term storage of nuclear power, of, of, of the radioactive materials, which is a, a, a significant unsolved problem, and I'm not sure you can put it aside. Uh, on all other aspects, nuclear power is safer, uh, less polluting than almost any of the alternatives. Uh, of course, uh, as, as everyone knows, uh, but nobody does, uh, the best solution is to stop using so damn much power. And, uh, uh, but, uh, but given the fact that we have to have it, uh, the arguments against nuclear power <laughs> As they, uh, the only rational arguments, one is cost, so right now it's cost, and the other is public concern. Uh, but I, I believe that it's irrational, but maybe politically essential for countries like Germany that are shutting down their power plants. But then, you know, something's going to happen. You know, they're not going to stop using power. They're going to start doing something else. They're going to have more coal power. They're going to be getting gas from unreliable countries that w that may blackmail them you know it, it's it's this you know it's the natural human tendency to focus on the immediate problem and not think through what are the consequences they do uh, the uh, I it's not quite clear. Uh, it looked like the fail-safe mechanism. I don't know the details of Fukushima, uh, but it looks like they didn't have a proper fail-safe mechanism there. Uh, you, you should have a gravitational fail-safe mechanism for, for the control rods, uh, and they clearly didn't. Uh, now, whether there was a early excursion that caused so much uh, Ther there was such a thermal pulse that it uh, that, that it uh, uh, twisted the rods so that they couldn't come in. But even then, I would have thought that there ought to have been, an, um, if I was designing a nuclear power plant, which fortunately I'm not, uh, one of the things I would put into it would be an emergency pump of a dump of boron, which is, a, you know, a and... Uh, so the major problem in retrospect that happened in Fukushima was a reluctance of the company to take drastic steps that would destroy the potential for the power plant to be restored. So they kept trying to do things that would not ruin ruin the uh, very large investment that they had. Uh, in retrospect, that was not a, not a very good decision. 
but but that was that was that was a critical part of their of of their decision making. So there were things that they could have done earlier that would have that would have worked. Uh, I will close this session and invite you to speak to Harold Schwartz if you have more questions.